Welcome to Lawmen, a podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm James Shakeshaft. And I'm Alistair Beckett King. You know plants, right? Heard of them. Familiar with their work. You know animals? Yes. Yes, I am <laughs> yeah. conversant with the concept. It's a combo of plants and animals. What? A planimal. You've shifted my paradigm, James. It's flora and fauna. i got to hear this story. It's the vegetable lamb of Tartary. Of course it is. Play that music. Play that copyright-free music, white boy. Hello, Alistair. Hi, James. I have such a wonderful treat for us today. I'm very excited. It's not your usual... Shakeshaft esque spooky ghost story that then turns into dust. <coughs> it's not. And then when they went into the cave, it was just a cave. Yeah. It's not one of those classic Shakeshaft twists, classic rug pulls. There is an element of that in there, in here, to be honest, which is one of my favourite bits. <laughs> but the majority of it is ah, oh, it's it's almost it's almost a history documentary. Whoa, but. Well, it's about the vegetable lamb of Tartary. <laughs> uh, that name brings me such delight. The vegetable lamb. Of Tartary. Of Tartary. It sounds fun and delicious at the same time. Also known as the Barrowmets. Oh. Or the Boromets. Oh. This creature. I came across it because I was looking for a nice picture of a dragon. Yep. And it sort of led into one of those Wikipedia holes of looking at, like, mythical creatures. This happens to me because I do the graphics for the podcast, and so I often have to try and find etchings. Mm. I feel like we should set up a Twitter for just no-context etching, because I think my favourite one is a cat dressed as the Pope being booed by a crowd. <laughs> I don't know what the cat did. I don't know what the Pope did, and I'll never know. No. There's another good etching you'll probably come across in one of the books that talks about the vegetable lamb of Tartary by Sir John Mandeville. The Travels of Sir John Mandeville. Just as a quick side note, this was a pretty much definitely made up book about a pretty much definitely made up person who claimed to have travelled the world and seen all these things, one of which being the Vegetable Lamb of Tartary. We'll get on to that. But another one was a deflowering ritual. Oh. And I couldn't really find any more context apart from a very funny etching, which is two people in bed and Sir John sort of stood next to him pointing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, what happened was I was looking I was looking for this lovely picture of a dragon and I saw I saw a few of the other mythical creatures, you know, your griffin, your hippo griff, your griff Reese Jones, yep. Cyclops, all that lot. And then I noticed nestled in there the vegetable lamb of Tartar. It's not a vegan version of the cheese hedgehog. <laughs> it's a type of zoophyte, which is an animal that looks like a plant. An animal that looks like a plant. Like a sea anemone. Or a sea cucumber. Right, yeah. A zoophyte is a word that is not really used by scientists anymore mm. because it was... This is circa sort of 11th century. It's around that time that there were these sort of science books, but they were mad. Yeah. Like how in the olden days they used to think that rats were generated by piles of rubbish. The, the rats just sprang into existence. Yes. Mm. I can't remember the name for that thing, but that's a thing. I like those those old natural philosophy books. And mis mysterious texts, like uh, the Voynich Manuscript and that sort of thing. Yes. Bit mainstream for us on this podcast, though, the Voynich Manuscript. Oh, very much so. The main place it sort of caught people in, in England's attention was in the travels of Sir John Mandeville, which was around the 14th century. And that's got all your classic skyopodes, hippophodes. Hippophodes being like people with horse feet. Oh. Yeah, hippo means horse. Yes. In Greek. Not hippo. Yes, as in hypocrite. What's that got to do with horses? No, it doesn't mean anything. Apart doesn't. from naysayers of a lot of them. Very good. I'm sure I've done that joke on this podcast before. It's my favourite horse joke. I've probably lied about hypocrisy being like horsepower. <laughs> Should be what it means. Should be. But it isn't. Cyclopses are obviously your one-eyed people. And your skyopodes, I think they thought there were these little short people who had one leg with a big foot that they used as an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> a 
I thought that was a real thing. There's a wonderful book called Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. I've, me- I've mentioned him on this podcast before, but I can't remember if I've told this story. Old SBG? Yeah. Have I mentioned the tailed humans before? No, maybe. Oh, okay. I don't want to hear it again. In Curious Myths of the Middle Ages, Sabine Baring Gould gathers together stories like this, uh, and he includes... Uh, tailed humans in that which are humans born with a tail mm. it's very interesting because he's writing in the 19th century and he ends it by saying that he thinks they're probably a myth he won't believe that they exist until one is shown to him and what's fascinating in a, in a book of complete nonsense humans with tails do exist it is a phenomenon that people are born with a small tail growing out mm. of their coccyx mm. And it's very nice that while sort of giant foot umbrellas and all the other nonsensical things are ridiculous and not true, some of those stories are real. Or misinterpretations of real things. Yes, that there is a a kernel of truth to some of them. A thing that cropped up in Shakespeare a couple of times was the, I think it's pronounced blemies. Blemies, which are headless people. The blemies? Or people whose heads are in their chests. Oh, I've heard of these people, yes. And they're, they're mentioned in The Tempest and Othello. It's a bit embarrassing for Shakespeare because <laughs> he was just report. You know, he was using what people thought was a real thing, and I think that's used as an example in the Tempest of like, hey, weird stuff goes on. There's those headless people that happens, and it doesn't. What some of the theories are for what they actually were is just certain types of warriors would kind of draw their heads down, and there's like a particular race of people that are very good at shrugging. <laughs> <laughs> it's the French. <laughs> it's just a Frenchman being asked for directions by an English person. Do you know where I can find the headless people? He is one. Oh, no, he's not. Où est l'homme sans tête? <laughs> S'il vous plaît. Je ne comprends pas. I like that. That's a bit like in Moby Dick, where he devotes, it feels like about nine long chapters to facts about whales that are not accurate facts anymore about whales. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so you have to read through like, oh, and the, the sperm whale is the largest whale. Like, it is famously not the largest whale. <laughs> the premise of the book is wrong. <laughs> it's still a very good book, John. But... <laughs> You've done a great job, but all your whale facts are wrong. (laughs) The travels of Sir John Mandeville kind of propagated all these nonsense-type stories. Some of them, though, true, like it talks about cormorant fishing in China and Japan. Have you ever heard of that? It's quite fun. No, I've never heard that. Not fun for a vegan. It's basically a way of fishing where you tie a bit of string around a cormorant's neck and it dives down and catches a fish, but it can't swallow it because you've got the string around its neck and then you get it to cough up the fish and then you eat the fish it's like double anti-vegan capitalism is what you've described there exploitation (laughs) the cormorant does all the work and sees none of the reward yeah that is it there's a little section on egypt in those days people in egypt thought that the pyramids were grain stores didn't ben carson the 2015 candidate for the republican presidency believe that the pyramids were grain stores really but like even a knight in the at the times when this book was written said knew better than ben carson he in essence said well they can't be grain stores there's nowhere to get the grain into them. And even if there were a hole at the top, how are you getting them out? Yeah. Like massive salt cellars. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Salt cellars of the gods. <laughs> Maybe that's what mana from heaven was. They just shook out a pyramid. Yeah, probably. I, don't, I don't know. I'm not a biblical scholar. No, but we can make it up. That's what they did. That's basically what they did. They sort of half heard something and then repeated it with their own embellishments. Oh, God, it's our podcast. <laughs> So these sort of things, these zoo fights, people know they don't exist nowadays, but there was a time when even things like the caterpillar fungus, have you heard of that? No. They thought that was like something that was half caterpillar, half fungus. It's in Tibet and it's a fungus that infects a caterpillar and kills it and then it grows out of its head. Oh, well, fair play to them for being confused. Yeah. Hearing about that led me down another little rabbit hole. Those things are incredibly valuable. They're used in like... Some sort of probably medicine. And in 2012, a pound of top quality of that stuff retailed at $50,000. Wow. That was the street value. 
for caterpillar fungus. In Tibet in 2004, the the sale of caterpillar fungus made up 8.5% of the country's GDP. Who who is doing the PR for caterpillar fungus? Because it it sounds awful. I can't believe anyone's been persuaded to pay for it. That's like if you manage to sell... You know when you go through like an underpass? You know the way cobwebs Mm. become kind of thick? I could... If I start selling that Mm. and become a millionaire, that's... no, No, no... I think we'll keep quiet now. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's your dragon's den. Cures what ails you. <laughs> Sooty web. Sooty thick web. And so all of this led me to uh, a download of an old book. A download, because to buy it, it costs 300 quid. Ooh. As... What, is it made of caterpillar fungus? It's The Vegetable Lamb of Tartary, A Curious Fable, by Henry Lee, sometime naturalist of the Brighton Aquarium. I really like his tone. He's very funny. And some of his other books, author of... The Octopus, or The Devil Fish of Fiction and of Fact, and other books, Sea Fables Explained, and my favourite, Sea Monsters Unmasked. <laughs> They've been getting away with too much. It's yeah. about time some investigative journalist really dug into it. This thing goes all the way to the bottom. Yeah. It's like the Cook Report, but for <laughs> the sea. So it talks about this, the, the vegetable lamb or the baromets. There's two different versions of this story. Uh, One is that it's a certain plant grew a fruit that looked a bit like a gourd and when it ripened it would burst open and inside was a tiny lamb. How big are we talking? Small. Palm your hand tiny? Yeah, I think so. Hmm, that sounds adorable. Like a Sylvanian family scale. The main version is a lot less adorable. It's uh, a plant that grew and out the top grew a lamb attached by its navel. It could bend enough to eat grass, but when it had eaten all the grass, it would die. What? And there's only an- one animal that would eat it, and that was the wolf. A-, a normal wolf, or like a plant wolf? Like half dandelion, half wolf? Standard wolf, standard wolf, standard free-roaming... Oh, sta- your standard wolf, okay. Mammal wolf. Well, it shouldn't be a particular challenge, for a, considering he's tethered to the spot. Well, the- Henry had heard, he'd heard that there was a version of this in the Talmud. He tracks down the story, he contacts a bunch of rabbis. A rabble of rabbis? <laughs> yeah. And this one particular rabbi looks into it for him. And the version, one version that this rabbi found was that it was a human that was attached to the ground by a navel stem. And it, it was in mountainous regions. Oh. And no creature could get near because it would seize and kill it. And the only way that you could, that you could kill it is to, you had to fire your arrow at its stem. And if you managed to snap the stem, then it withered and died. So the human would kill people, the, hu- the yes. human vegetable lamb. And then, and then another version says it's, it's a lamb, actually, and it tastes like fish. <laughs> and its blood was as sweet as honey, which is ho- sounds horrible. Disgusting, like a mixture of honey and fish. Ugh. It's like a pudding black pudding. <laughs> I always think it's odd, the things that go together taste-wise, mm. like pineapple and gammon go together, but you never see pigs and pineapples together in nature Mm. they never hang out that's true so there's no hint i've never seen a duck eating an orange no exactly but they do work together so i don't blame people for trying to put you know mint on a chicken or honey on a fish but i've just started imagining it it's disgusting (laughs) um and the the rabbi says that it's more likely that it was a lamb than a person fair enough it was a vegetable lamb rather than vegetable person actually (laughs) i think the vegetable person thing is a bit fanciful a little far-fetched and there's some more details on this little vegetable lamb It, it did appear to have horns or hooves but they were made out of very fine hair and so this Boromets was from areas of Russia near the Caspian Sea is where the, the Tartar area mm. is where most of the myth came from. Apparently its wool was very soft and highly prized and the people of that area used to make hats out of it. Mm. We're talking sort of fungus caterpillar price? How, what are we talking here? Oh, I don't know. Highly, mm. highly, highly prized. prized. Mm. Uh, the pelt of it was so thin and delicate that when it dried out, it stopped looking like a lamb. Mm. 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 That's my, and then it turned to dust moment. <laughs> so you finally got the pelt of this mythical lamb, yeah. Oh, and you won't believe what happened. It dried out and stopped looking like a lamb. So that's proof. Yeah. So the story was reported by lots of different people through the years, and lots of people with amazing names. Sigismund von Herbenstein. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine it was sort of flying over the landscape in a self-constructed sort of <laughs> device, just 
gathering plants in a big net. That's my. That is how I visualise yeah. von Herbenstein. Was it Herberstein? I think Herberstein. And it sounds like he's got a horse in that race, doesn't it? If he's <laughs> from the Herb family, <laughs> he was fourteen percent plump. And they started this nerd feud argument. You know when you see people arguing about like plot holes in Star Wars and stuff like that. Yes, I am. I am aware that there are nerds out there, James. Stay safe. <laughs> Woot, woot, it's the sound of the geeks. <laughs> and so, yeah, he reported about it. And then Girolamo Cardano said, that's stupid. I'm paraphrasing again. He said, that's stupid. If it has blood, it must have a heart. And soil can't supply a heart with movement or heat. I tell you what, he's got him banged to right there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is true, isn't it? Uh, yeah. He wanted to put one final nail in the coffin. And another thing, it's too cold to grow something like that in the air. You can get them in the sea because the sea's thicker. Um, I'm not sure that is unassailable logic, mm. that you could have a vegetable lamb in the sea because it's thicker. That was also seized upon by, according to Henry Lee, this Girolamo Cardano's relentless enemy. <laughs> Sorry, can you say his name again? Because you, you've made him sound like he's a sort of East London mechanic. Girolamo Cardano. <laughs> Uh, it's beautiful in your accent the lack of effort put into giving it an italian or spanish twang i don't know where he's where's he from i think he's italian he is italian Gir- girolamo cardano oh lovely no i like girolamo cardano well it was seized upon by his relentless enemy and his name julius caesar scaliger <laughs> Henry Lee reports that this julius caesar scaliger wrote a scathing takedown and i read through it and it seems to just repeat the myth and then at the end, it sort of mildly sarcastically goes, but how can they grow four different legs on the same plant? Uh, that's a bit of a weird objection. Yeah, I don't really get it. Of if... all the things to have a problem with. I mean, I'm, I'm fully on board with the, the soil heart take, <laughs> yep. that interpretation. But the how can it have four legs? Well, like, how can a tree have four branches? No, I don't accept it. It's too subtle if it is sarcasm. I think. Yeah, keep walking, Scaliger. And the problem is, because it was too subtle, his writing is often credited as being like an example of a of a, a good thinker agreeing with this idea. Oh dear. So it's very much backfired on him. So that's kind of a warning to people who write sarcastic tweets, I think. And to people who name their children Julius Caesar. <laughs> yeah. This is the kind of thing that will happen. Yeah, they're going to grow up to be a bit of a... Yeah, what he should have had in his bio was something like retweets are not endorsement, just to clarify <laughs> that sometimes he's being sarcastic. Yeah. So yeah, his writing is often quoted as evidence and people such as Claude Duret or Claude Durrett <laughs> said it's probably possible because the air in Tartar is quite dense. Again, with the air thickness. <laughs> Always with the air thickness. Why does the air... I don't understand why the air needs to be thick for this to happen. Because it's too cold otherwise. For you to grow an embryo in the what open is, air. What does air thick? What does it mean? Because the air gets thinner as you go up a mountain, mm. and that makes it you can't have lambs. I don't get it. I don't understand. No, me neither. But people still carried on looking for it even into the 1600s. Uh, Jans Janzoon Strauss. He was taken in, and he bragged about buying some skins of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did they not look like lamb skins? Because that's the key quality they need to have to definitely be lamb skins. Yeah, he paid quite a lot for them, it seems. Then in 1683, Dr. Engelbrecht Kampfer, <laughs> he searched all over Tartaret and just found ordinary sheep. <laughs> Every one of these is like you're just making it up. I know. It's, it was just a big list of people who went looking for it with a ridiculous name and found either sheep or plants, <clears throat> but ne'er the twain. <laughs> and then it was Humbert Candlewax. Then it was Simon Pibblepinks. Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> Is that, what, is that really one of them? He didn't go looking for it. He just wrote a poem about it. Oh, all right, fair enough. But the thing, the the problem was, at around this time, there started to, to show up lots of little ferns that had been shaped to represent a dog. Mm. And people thought this was examples of the vegetable lamb. I, and he includes an illustration of this, and we'll try and put it on the on Twitter or, or on the website or something. It looks very much like a poo. With, do you remember the old crisps, French fries? Uh, yes, yes, I remember French fries. A maize crisp in the vein of like a square what's it. Yeah, if the what's it was penne, this is the tagliatelle. Yep. Yeah, it looks like some of them stuck in a poo. <laughs> and in 1715... 
John Bell travelled Persia, and while he was there, he searched for it and, again, just found bushes. <laughs> but what's that behind the bush? A, a different bush. Put it on the list. He's got an unusually normal name for somebody searching for it. John Bell. Yeah. His middle name, not like John Genghis Khan Bell or something. Yeah. <laughs> John Adolf Bell. <laughs> and Sahan Sloan and Dr. Brain... <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bray, I've only just read it because it's spelt B R E Y N and said it out loud. And I've just realised it's called Dr. Brain. Come into the, my room, Dr. Brain. I have much to discuss. What is it, Hans Sloan? We have the same voice, yes. Both the same voice. <laughs> they exhibited a lot of these models that turned out to be made out of ferns from New Zealand that have been. Fashioned by people in China, apparently. Wow, think of the carbon footprint. Of the and of what seemed like such a ethical food stuff. <laughs> I mean I'm still visualizing like poos with what's it stuck in. Is that what this is? That's basically what these some of these look more had been better fashioned into looking like dogs. But basically it was people in China were trying to make these ferns look like dogs, and people in Europe thought they looked like sheep and that they were a real thing. I don't know who's more to blame in that. It's, no, it's uh, people in Europe for being idiots. That's yeah. who it is. Yeah. And basically, it all turns out that it was people just misunderstanding the cotton plant. Oh, the the cotton plant. Yeah. It's basically in from the 1100s in Europe, in Northern Europe, we didn't have cotton. And then they started interacting with people who did have cotton and seeing this. And I guess we in Northern Europe at that time just wore animal pelts. Yeah. If if that. So when we saw someone wearing this thing, we we're like, what's that? And they're like, oh, it comes from a plant. And it goes, must be an animal on the plant. Mm. It's very rare that our stories ever have an actual explanation for what happened. And that's why they call it cotton wool. Is it? I think so, yeah. Mic drop. <laughs> I was about to drop my mic. Because it's wool of a lamb, but it's cotton. They think it's called cotton wool. Is that that's your mic drop? <laughs> yeah, I've dropped the mic now. Honourable mention for barnacle geese. <laughs> From the Western Islands of Scotland. The vegetable lamb with support from barnacle geese. <laughs> it was just a barnacle that had a little feathery growth and then loads of people started saying that they'd opened them up and there were definitely geese in there. <laughs> and they were just lying. Right then, are you ready to score me? I am ready to score you, yes. I'm ready to be scored. I've been very impressed with this. I don't know if it's a story. It's a mythical creature, isn't it? Yeah. I like him. The vegetable lamb. The vegetable lamb. Yeah, he's not ostentatious. No. Like, as you say, you know, your unicorns, the big boys. He doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't do anything. eats eats all the food around him and then dies. Very much like me at Christmas. (laughs) I eat all the food I can reach and then I wither and die. (laughs) (laughs) So what's your first category? Um... Should we just get Supernatural out of the way? i got a feeling I'm not going to score very well on Supernatural. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Look, okay, I'll level with you. We've, we've got a problem because if he's a, if he's a magical creature, then obviously it's a high score, mm-hmm. except that he's described as being a, a genuine plant that exists yes. in the real world. Yeah. And, of course, if it's biological in nature, then it, and it's not Supernatural, is it? How does that heart go? However, I am going to go for a four. Okay. Because I think he is... Super nature. It is super nature, isn't it? It is, and nature can be super. So I, I think uh, it's not in the strict meaning of the word supernatural, but I think it is a super example of nature. Right, great then. Well then, with that that wind pushing my sails or something, uh, I'm going to barrel straight into naming. All right, well, you, you've pulled an ABK here by just choosing yes. a story that has a list of amazing names. Yes. The Vegetable Lamb, Blemies, Baromets. Sir John Mandeville. Percival Nimbleshanks. <laughs> Sigismund von Herberstein. <laughs> Elbow Wheeze. Girolama Cardano. <laughs> and his mortal enemy, Julius Caesar Scaliger. <laughs> Jans <laughs> Janzoon Strauss. <laughs> on bass. I mean, they just sound like a, a Belgian jazz band. Uh, it's... So Dr. good. Dr. Engelbrecht Kempfer. <laughs> On maracas. <laughs> Dr. Erasmus Darwin. John Bell. Nope. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can withdraw a full point for John Pol Pot Bell, uh, because he, there's too many other good names. It's five out of five. It's five out of five. The Barnacle Geese. And the bar- 
<laughs> the barnacle and, geese. Of course, the barnacle geese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like that but in a very sort of sombre tone uh, of course uh, we can not forget the barnacle geese who died today <laughs> all very grateful to the barnacle geese for their sacrifice <laughs> it's, it's five out of five if I haven't said that already that's someone's hammering stop hammering again no hip hop in the podcast please <laughs> please hammer stop ha- hammering <laughs> Is that how it started? Was he just doing a bit of DIY and misunderstood a complaint? <laughs> yeah, maybe he just painted something and was like, well, you can't touch this. <laughs> so next category, the vegan dilemma. Mm, this is the uh, the, the fish-flavoured honey plant. The, the, a lamb, a vegetable lamb. Yeah. And he has blood that tastes like honey. And a lot of people don't realise that honey isn't vegan. But it's not, because as we all know, bees can actually build small chapels in their own hives. Yeah. They're very intelligent creatures. They deserve a a decent wage. I once read a vegan pamphlet that's trying to get people to stop eating honey. Mm -hmm. And a lot of vegan literature is a a little bit preaching to the choir, Mm. uh, a very unlikely to persuade a sceptical onlooker. And I think it said something like, uh, over 300 bees are killed or injured every year. And it's or injured that really gets me. (laughs) I mean, I shouldn't find it uh, that amusing. An injured bee is a horrible thing to see. But I can't help but imagine a sort of Vietnam vet Mm. bee just cursing the honey industry that you would imagine them. as well if a bee lost a leg they've got five other legs they've, yeah it's not they've that. got five more mate they've got five more legs and also the number is way too small <laughs> considering the number of bees that must be involved in honey production like if we've got it down to only 300 bees those it's only 300 bees that are able to claim for their <laughs> workplace related injuries <laughs> According to the figures put out by Big Honey. <laughs> if you believe those, honey in itself is a dilemma. Never mind the, the honey-flavoured blood of a lamb that's also a marrow. It's like the ultimate, like, you know, how people try and catch out vegans. Do I? <laughs> people are always trying to, leaping at me on the street, jumping out from corners and saying, what about your belting your shoes? <laughs> what about uh, the bacteria that makes bread... Rise. What if you were on a desert island and all they had was a pig and some pineapple? What would you do? What if the pig was very generous? <laughs> yes. So points for vegan dilemma for the vegetable lamb of tartary. It's, it is five out of five. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, would you have a tartar sauce on ooh, it? Ooh, is that vegan? Uh, it tasted of fish. What is tartar sauce? I've never had it. Probably got eggs in it, hasn't it? Yeah. It's I think it's basically vegan. mayonnaise with um, gherkins in it. It's super not vegan. The whole region of tartar is not vegan. So... Five out of five. Final category. Why lie? <laughs> um, I, li- I really like the category. Why lie? It's just, I just don't. What were people thinking? <laughs> Why did they make this up? Why would you make it up? Like, oh, and all the other stuff, like the people with the, the one legged people that use their massive foot as an umbrella. If you were going to evolve an umbrella, you'd evolve it from your head or shoulders. <laughs> Yeah. The feet area is the last place you want an umbrella. Why would you involve an umbrella? Why not involve a wheel? <laughs> or a second leg. <laughs> a caterpillar track. Yeah, I would have been putting all my effort into becoming a biped, not getting accessories. <laughs> Let me get the rain off and then I'll be able to concentrate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, maybe we could involve a second leg if it wasn't for this bloody rain. <laughs> And now they're like, well, I don't need a second leg because it's not raining that much. <laughs> yeah, I can't go anywhere anyway while I'm using the umbrella. It's either hop around, get wet, or sit in a puddle, <laughs> getting with just your foot wet. And there's the, the shruggy, chesty-faced guys. That That's not true. Yeah, the blemmies. The blemmies. I don't think that's the really the proper pronunciation, but it's how I'm going with it. It sounds a little bit like movies. It makes me think of movies. Yes. Careful. Sorry. Movie warning. Mooey warning. We're all locked in our houses. We don't want to incite Mooey madness. <laughs> Do you know the story of where Nike trainers come from originally? Uh, no, I know that it's a Greek god or goddess. But N- Nike trainers, a trainer guy, went to Japan and saw these particular brand of trainers, the Onitsuka Tigers, and he just bought them, bought shiploads of them. I said shiploads, you don't need to bleep that. And Got them shipped over to America and just changed the logo, and that those were the first Nikes. 
like Cortez and started selling them as Nikes and just presumed that, you know, the world wouldn't get to a place where that would get mm. found out. No one else was going to see trainers in Japan. So we could just import them and rebadge them and sell them on. Really? How we were talking about before about how, like, celebrities do did adverts abroad like in in areas like Japan because they were like well the media there stays there it's not going to affect my brand yes in other countries like you say Clooney only does stuff outside of America mm. but now with the internet everyone can see those adverts everyone can see that Tommy Lee Jones is the face of coffee in Japan and yeah like these people were like oh how was your holiday oh it was mad oh, I saw some people with no heads on holiday <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you go Tata have you been there no right there's these plants, they grow lambs. Why lie? I had a, a, a friend who lived in the same cul-de-sac as me when I was a kid, and uh, he said his dad was a cowboy. Oh. Yeah, but his dad was an insurance salesman. And also they had ghosts in their shed, but um, I wasn't allowed to go in the shed to see them. <sighs> but there were three. And I think the ghosts were also cowboys. Possibly members of his posse who had uh, followed him. Or he double-crossed. Yeah, now that I think about it. Perhaps. But I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't see any of them. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine told me about a lad at his school who used to say that his dad his dad had a Jaguar that had Ataris in the back seats. <laughs> the Jaguar car, sorry. <laughs> I need to explain the Jaguar as a type of car. <laughs> Uh, a friend of mine uh, was was late and claimed that he had uh, fallen in a hole and had his leg bitten by a crocodile over the scrambles. <laughs> Not the scrambles. You and I know the scrambles can be a rough place, but mm-hmm. it's not known for many crocodiles. But we do know you want to stay out of the stream. <laughs> yeah, if you're anywhere near Sherburn. I think it's five out of five for, for Why Lie. I don't, I don't know if it's just the mm. uh, the glow of lockdown. I don't know if it's uh, just the warmth of your presence, James, but I'm feeling very generous. Mm-hmm. It's another five out of five. Brilliant. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'll take those scores. Plant them in a little ground, put a little water on it. Yeah. You can grow, grow yourself some some more scores, some new numbers. Score plant. Ooh, a delicious citrus three. Mm. Yeah. I suppose most vegetables are noughts and ones, though. You can get some gourds that are shaped like an eight. Ah, uh, yes. Or infinity. Or infinity, which is the biggest number. Infinite gourds. If you're listening to our podcast, infinite gourds. <laughs> well, we ask, <laughs> what if there were loads more gourds? No, no, no. More than that. If there were an infinite number of gourds, maybe one of them would have a lamb in it. Definitely. If it were infinite, it would have to. They'd have everything. There'd be a gourd that you could use as an MP3 player. My gourd's got an Atari in the back. <laughs> I think we better stop before our gourd madness takes over. Before we give away many more of our money-making ideas. Yep. Gourd almighty. Definitely stop now. Stop. <laughs> that a was few it. That was the ago. point. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Under no circumstances, leave that in the podcast. <laughs> So it turned out it was cotton all along, yeah. James. Not dust this time. What a twist. Fluff. Fluff. <laughs> You've been listening to Lawmen. If you enjoy this podcast, you can subscribe, you can leave us a review, give us a tweet, or if you're feeling super, super generous, you could sling us a few quid on coffee.com. What's coming up next week, James? Next week, we've got Rachel Fairburn from the All Killer No Filler podcast, and we have got a bunch of Cornish legends. <laughs> That was a Cornish accent. I will let the listener be the judge of that. When I was doing the research, I forgot my amazing book, The Book of Imaginary Beings by the famous Argentinian writer, whose name I've only ever seen written down and I've never heard anyone say out loud. In fact... I can't ask for it in bookshops because I'm that unconfident in his name. Georges Louis Borges. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I think it's Jorge Luis Borges. But I do not know either. I also am a, I'm a British white man. Basically, his first name, J-O-R-G-E, and his last name, B-O-R-G-E-S. Yeah. Is he like Sean Bean in S? <laughs> <laughs> He's very much the, the Sean Bean of... Um... What is he, a magical realist? Yeah, I think so. Of course there's an entry on the baromets in this. And most of it I think we covered, but there is one little bit that reminded me of another area of the podcast. He says in describing the baromets being a mixture of animal and vegetables. Oh, yeah. Whereas most other monsters are a mixture of two different animals. So Mm. it's kind of unique in that sense. And he said it brings to mind the mandrake 
because it cries out like a man when it's ripped from the earth. Which reminded me of the mistake I made a couple of episodes ago about. <laughs> yep. And also, in the time since we recorded this episode, I thought of the ultimate vegan quandary. Yeah. The vegan dilemma. Pig Hitler. <laughs> if you could go back in time and kill pig hit, Piglet Hitler, because <laughs> you know that Piglet Hitler is going to become a grown-up Pig Hitler. No, it's a problem. I think I would kill him, but not eat him. Mm. I don't think I would eat Hitler under any circumstances. What a waste!